Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Women's Issues Think Tank of the Center for the Women of New York. And uh, today we have a very important uh, topic, and um, it's uh, inequities in women's health. Um, we have our own board member, Lara Kulura, who's going to be presenting. Thank you so much, Lara, for doing this. Um, in case you don't know the center, you're not familiar with our organization, the Center for the Women of New York helps women overcome financial violence, social wellness and legal issues by raising awareness and advocating for full gender equality for women, understanding their needs and connecting them with CWNY services, nonprofit partner organizations and public resources to aid, uplift and address their challenges. My name is Cecilia, I'm the president of the Center for the Women of New York. We have Victoria, our vice president here, Karen, Lara, uh, who are on our board, and I cannot see if there's someone else from the organization, but thank you everyone so much for joining us. We have two locations, both are in Queens. Um, here are the two pictures of where we are. One is in Queensborough Hall, and another, um, I am now in Fort Totten, uh, which is in Bayside. So come visit us. Our current programs are referrals and advocate program. So if you don't know if we have a service, um, scholars will, if we don't have the service, we'll send you, we'll guide you in the right direction, we'll refer you somewhere else. We have a financial literacy workshop series, a uh, career workshop series. Uh, we have two support groups, one for women in crisis and one for caregivers, which is, you know, for, for those of us who are taking care of elderly or like aging family members. We just had a one-on-one -on -one tax preparation assistance. We'll have it again next year around March and gardening and sustainability workshops, which are in our Fort Totten location in Bayside, conversational ESL classes, a legal support team with, um, that answers uh, to inquiries via email, we have yoga classes, self-esteem workshops um, that are awesome. And we just started a, the Women's Issues Think Tank a few months ago. So welcome. Uh, if you'd like to see any of our past events um, that were virtual, such as this one, you can find them in our uh, website, uh, cwny.org slash past dash events. If you have questions, they will be addressed after the presentation. You can use the chat box uh, or the Q&A feature. If you dial in, uh, you can email your questions to events at cwny.org and someone will be monitoring that email address and we will make sure that we um, answer your questions or Lara answers your questions. Now I'll turn it over to Lara. Thank you again for presenting today. So today I'm going to talk about inequities in women's cardiovascular health. Since I am a cardiologist, that is the part that I'm going to focus on. Um, and so we can begin. All right, so first I have a quiz question for everyone. Uh, what is the leading cause of death in women? Is it cardiovascular disease, including heart attack and stroke, cancer or breast cancer? Now, obviously you don't have to like answer out loud or anything, but uh, you can just think about it in your head. It is probably like a little bit of a hint, the fact that I'm talking about uh, heart disease, <laughs> but uh, heart disease is actually the leading killer in America for women. Um, kills more women than any other disease and almost five times as many die from heart attacks every year than from breast cancer alone. Uh, but this is not necessarily what people know when you survey women. Um, and uh, so many women don't know that this is the leading cause of death and uh, awareness has actually decreased recently for in women. Um, so there was a survey in 2009 uh, where this question was asked and 56% of women were able to name heart disease as the number one cause of death. Uh, and a repeat survey, survey was done 10 years later in 2019, and that number actually decreased to 44%. So um, we definitely have some work to do about uh, uh, spreading the information about how heart disease really does affect women. Okay, so uh, so I wanted to break this down into like, where are these problems or inequities happening? I mean, there's multiple places where there's discrepancies or, or uh, missing links about uh, treating cardiovascular disease in women. So one of the things is say, I 
symptom I'm calling before the hospital. So sometimes women ignore or minimize their symptoms and come to the hospital later when they're having a cardiac event. Um, as we know, men, women often wear multiple hats and uh, are busy taking care of often other people and uh, maybe are not focusing on themselves or taking care of themselves or you know paying attention to what's going on in their bodies. Um, and then sometimes this can be because women's symptoms can be different than what was historically thought of as heart attack symptoms. Uh, so people may not realize the symptom that they're having is actually representing a heart attack or um, some other cardiovascular event, because historically, a lot of the things that we th typically think of were, you know, based on how men present when they have a heart attack or other cardiac event. Um, and, you know, there's that's kind of just a bias everywhere. Uh, that that doesn't mean that that's the gold stand, standard or that women present differently. It's just that we kind of didn't look at the whole population when we started saying that this is the you know the way that people present for heart attacks. So there's a little um, slide here for symptoms in men versus women. So importantly, both men and women can have chest pain. I think there's this idea that maybe women don't present with chest pain for heart attacks, but they definitely do. So either men or women can have chest pain or pressure or squeezing feeling in their chest. Um, sometimes the pain can go to the neck, uh, jaw, or upper back, um, can be associated with nausea or vomiting feeling. And th this again is the same for all men and women or some shortness of breath or if you're having problems breathing can be signs of a heart attack. But in addition to this, women often have, can have other symptoms. In, and so things like fainting or indigestion or extreme fatigue. And those are the kind of things that kind of are not typically associated with heart attacks, but we see that women have those symptoms with their cardiac events. So it, uh, it is helpful for everyone to be aware of these other ways that women can present with their heart attack. Oops, sorry, wrong computer. Okay. So then let's say the woman finally does, you know, realize that they're having a problem and they come to the hospital, then we have problems at the hospital part of the equation where uh, once women present to the hospital, studies show that they wait longer to be evaluated than men coming in with chest pain symptoms. And even when women present with kind of the typical chest pain symptoms that we think of for heart attack, uh, women and people of color waited longer to be evaluated in emergency rooms than men did. Uh, women are less likely to get certain treatments for heart, for say heart attacks. Uh, there are certain things that are considered like the standard treatments for heart attacks, uh, including specific cardiac testing, specific procedures and medications that should be given in initially and then going forward after the treatment. And studies show that women do not get the uh, as much of these recommended treatments as compared to men. Um, and the disparity is especially seen for younger women. Older women tend to kind of be a little bit more evenly given these tests and, and medications, but um, definitely younger women are, is where we see a, a bigger disparity within not getting these treatments and medications. Um, and I think this is another kind of bias where people think that younger women don't have heart problems, but they most definitely can have heart problems um, and should be treated the same no matter what the age is. Um, okay. Okay, so uh, just to go over some risk factors for cardiovascular disease, uh, lifestyle factors can account for up to 70% of the risk of cardiovascular disease. Other things that are not so much in our control are genetics and then social determinants of health, which is a huge part of medical care um, re relating to income, education, access to health care. I mean, that's a huge topic on its own, causing inequities in health care for sure. Okay, so general risk factors for everyone for heart disease are smoking. Smoking, definitely something that can be modified and decrease your risk of, of heart disease. So other things that can be managed, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes or high sugar, 
uh, a diet or a heart healthy diet, which is really like not processed foods and less red meat and more fruits and vegetables, things like that. Um, maintaining a healthy weight or trying to at least somewhat improve your weight can be helpful. And then physical activity, uh, which doesn't have to be like running marathons. I don't want anybody to go out and start running a marathon, but it's just that the way our life is set up now, we tend to kind of be sedentary. A lot of the jobs are sedentary. So, you know, having physical activity, some body movement every day, some walking and things like that is very beneficial to your heart. So these are the factors that affect everyone, men and women. Now there are some sex specific risk factors that are lesser known to both patients and health, healthcare professionals. Uh, so things that put women at increased risk of having cardiovascular events are things like early first menses or early menopause, uh, polycystic ovary disease, also called PCOS, um, high blood pressure during pregnancy, which is also uh, preeclampsia or eclampsia, um, diabetes during pregnancy, gestational, which is also called gestational diabetes, um, inflammatory and autoimmune diseases, which affect women more than men, things like lupus and rheumatoid arthritis put you at higher risk of having uh, cardiac disease. Um, and chemotherapies for cancers can sometimes cause heart problems. And it, it happens that the ones that are cancers that are more common in women, like breast cancer, those medications have a higher risk of causing heart problems. And, and just to show you that, uh, you know, this is the lesser well-known for healthcare professionals is I currently work at a hospital and I work with residents and I asked them this morning if they knew about these being higher risk for our women and they did not. So it's certainly an area that needs to be improved on uh, education for healthcare professionals. Okay, so in addition to heart attack, women face a high risk of stroke as well. Uh, so one in five women will have a stroke. Uh, about 55,000 more women than men have a stroke each year. Uh, it's the number three cause of death in women. Uh, and black women have the highest prevalence of stroke in all women. And this is another thing where, you know, when we look at studies that women don't get the treatment necessarily equivalently, say in the ER or even after that they should uh, for stroke care. And so stroke symptoms in um, women versus men, again, these some of these are the same for, for either sex, and then there's some additional ones for women to consider. So any kind of change in the face or like part of the face drooping can be a sign of stroke. Um, arm weakness or really any limb weakness, uh, sudden weakness could be a sign of stroke. Difficulty speaking or slurred speech uh, is a sign of stroke or vision problems, suddenly losing part of your vision or not being able to see. Uh, trouble walking or lack of coordination can be a sign of a stroke and a severe headache without a known cause and, and much more than a prior, any prior headaches can be a sign of a stroke. And so in addition to that, women can have other symptoms like general weakness, disorientation, confusion, or memory problems, fatigue, or nausea or vomiting. So this is another place where there's some additional symptoms to be aware of for women versus men. Uh, just for, in general, for everyone to be aware of strokes, there's an acronym used by the American Stroke Association um, that's called FAST. So it's something like to remind about the symptoms of stroke, like facial drooping, arm weakness, and speech difficulty, and that it's time to call 911. I know that they even did this in the school because my kids came home and were talking about this, trying to spread awareness of uh, getting treatment quickly for a stroke. Because as it, as it says in here on the bottom is that the, the faster you can get treatment, the more likely the patient is to recover and not have continued deficits. Okay, some, something else that um, women don't get the same uh, uh, treatment as men for is that um, bystander CPR. And what that means is if somebody collapses, you know, outside of the hospital, before they reach the hospital, you know, if anyone is around them, they can start CPR. And there's a study from 2017 that showed, you know, 19,000 people who had cardiac events, uh, only 39% of women received CPR from bystanders in public versus 45% of men. Uh, and the uh, odds of men surviving the cardiac event were higher than women. Um, so some of the reasons for this could be like myths about women, that women have less heart problems, that women are maybe more likely to dramatize their symptoms. And, uh, and other people may be concerned about touching a woman and being accused of inappropriate touching. 
Uh, but this is definitely something that we could try to raise awareness for that both men and women would benefit from any kind of CPR that someone can give before the you know emergency medical uh, staff gets there. Okay, another area of inequity and underrepresentation is in clinical clinical trials. Uh, so historically, women and people of color have been underrepresented in clinical trials. Um, you know, many of the prior trials in, in cardiac patients were were mostly men, mostly men for such a long time. And uh, participation in clinical trials is important because if they are not included in the trial. And we don't really know if they will benefit from the treatments and therapies that we're talking about using. Um, so there has been, you know, a focus on this and the numbers are rising, but this is definitely a place where uh, more equity is needed uh, to, think, to make things, the trials much more representative of, you know, people out in the world and Americans that we're treating. Okay, so another way that uh, we can try to, you know, improve the uh, inequalities for women in healthcare is to increase representation in healthcare. Um, this is like many other things that if you have more people of uh, different backgrounds, that you can get more um, more inclusion. So the good news is that enrollment in medical school is now more than half of women. So at the beginning of medical school, now 51% of the class is women. Um, there are still disparities though further down the line from that because uh, there's still less women in advanced specialties, academic positions, and leadership positions in medicine, which of course those are the ones that are making the policies, so it would be helpful to have more women in those positions. And uh, one thing to think about, which is not always perhaps under your control, but you may want to consider going to a female physician. There is a study from JAMA in 2017 that shows that patients treated by women's physicians had a lower mortality and less re readmissions to the hospital. And another study showed that when female patients came into an emergency room with heart attack and they compared the patients that were seen by women physicians and the patients who were treated by male physicians, the women who were treated by female physicians were had better outcomes than the female patients treated by men. Whereas the male patients treated by female versus male physician didn't matter, the outcomes were the same. So obviously there is some bias going on there. It probably unconscious, but it's definitely showing in the outcomes. Okay, but I would like to say that there is hope. There are definitely things going on to try to reduce these disparities. Uh, the American Heart Association just published recently a call to action for cardiovascular disease in women um, to address all of these issues and highlight the issues. Uh, the Go Red campaign for women has been going on now for at least 10 years to raise awareness that uh, heart disease is in fact the number one killer of women. Uh, and then, of course, community outreach programs like something like this that we're talking about now to raise awareness. Um, and I will say it for myself anecdotally, I've been here now for 10 years teaching uh, residents, and I have noticed a difference in the past 10 years because I've kind of at some point during the you know my teaching have presented a clinical scenario with you know a younger woman coming in with with heart attack symptoms, and I would ask what treatment would you give. And in the beginning, people would get it wrong and they wouldn't give the, the woman, the, the, you know, the hypothetical woman in the scenario, the treatment, the standard treatment that they should be getting. Um, and, but I have noticed that recently in the past few years that, that they're not getting that question wrong as often. So I do think that, you know, there is a push in medical schools as well to inform, you know, the new incoming uh, medical students and new incoming doctors about the discrepancies and to try to create more equality in treatment and care. Okay, that is my presentation. And so I'm gonna stop my share if I can. So I much, Lara. Um, I'd like to open into questions. I know Amela had some questions. You can you don't have to put them in the chat now, Amela. You can just unmute yourself and ask them. Is she still here? Yes. Um so um when when there's a concern of CPR, are there CPR met methods that uh, don't involve mouth-to-mouth? -mouth? 
Yes, and that's a very good question. Yes, um, recently there have been, like for the past few years now, recommendations that you do not have to do uh, mouth to mouth for you know what, what we call bystander CPR, that if you see you're out and about and you see someone collapse, that you just do the compressions and you don't have to do mouth to mouth. Because that, yeah, that's a good point. That's probably one of the reasons why people hesitate is that they don't want to be you know right on top of somebody that they don't know. Um, but yes, that there is a very good benefit from just doing the CPR portion. Emily, did you have another question? Some things are coming to your mind. Yes. So um, this might sound a little silly, but can men also get breast cancer? Yes. No, that's not silly. That's a good question. Uh, men can get breast cancer. It's just much less likely for men to have it, but it absolutely can happen. Um, and so it's since it's not as common, they don't have the typical screening and things like women do, uh, but it certainly is possible. Thank you. Anyone else has any questions? I have some, but I'll let everyone go. <laughs> Is there anything in the chat? I didn't look at the chat. Uh, no, it was a Mel that uh, wanted to ask a question, but they asked. And I, I just want to say, like we 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 chose to, um, you know, have Lara give this presentation as one of the examples, but there's so many. I mean, like the idea of this think tank is like just to this class and like. There, and raise awareness about women's issues. There's so many inequities, not only in cardiology, and I learned a lot now, uh, but there's so many topics. I mean, I just like, I just had, I'll share quickly, I um, took my daughters to the dentist and there was a big, um, like since they've been going to the dentist, like I, I was told that they need to go to the orthodontist, orthodontist and they did uh, this time. And the first question, uh, the first thing that the orthodontist said to my oldest daughter was like, hi, Sudi, what is it that you want to um, fix in your smile? Mm -hmm. And I honestly like that approach. And she, she didn't mention that like girls deserve a great smile. Uh, so when you're, when you're growing up, like if, if, if a physician, if a professional knows about like the issues, tells you, Girls deserve a, a, a great smile, and they, you know, they said they they wanted to do an expander and and the braces. And I asked the question um, of like, is there any health related issue with her tooth being out of line, like not not aligned with the other teeth? And the real, like she did not have anything to say, but she kept saying, "Girls deserve a good smile, a great smile." Mm -hmm. So I like, I, I just want to like mention, and I feel like as adults, we sometimes, you know, take that, just take it. Um, so you mentioned like in a, in a young brain, if you're already like being told that you have to fix something, there's something wrong, but really it doesn't have anything to do with your health. That's like, I think starting there, there are inequities and, and sometimes it's not intentional as you said, Lara, but um, there are inequities. The other uh, issue that always crosses my mind is when a couple doesn't want, like, doesn't want to have kids anymore. Uh, what's the first like to go solution? Like the women tie their tubes. Um, but I, I don't know, Lara, if you want to comment on that. I don't know the you know the medical uh, issues, but my understanding is that uh, a vasectomy is much more simpler. Then. Much easier. Yes, it's a much less invasive procedure than a tubal ligation. Absolutely. Uh, um, but uh, if, if if you get together, like you know, a few men, like same amount of men and women, and ask them, they will be willing to do it, even though it's a much more complex uh, procedure to have their tubes tied. Uh, you'll probably have a lot more women saying yes, I would do it, and more men saying no. So I think it is important to have these conversations, um, you know, like to, to raise awareness and to empower women and to make them own their health and the decisions that they make. Dr. Calero, we do have a question from Louise. Mm -hmm. I have celiac disease. Is that an autoimmune disease that would increase the chance of heart disease? Hmm. 
Uh, so celiac disease definitely is an autoimmune disease. I'm not sure if that one is associated with um, more heart disease because I'm more thinking of the lupus and rheumatoid arthritis and psoriasis, but I can check and get back to you because that's not something I know off the top of my head. I'll write it down and I can get back to you. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, what was, what was that, that disease that, um, that Victoria had mentioned? The thyroid? Uh, celiac, C-E-L-I-A-C. Oh, yes, because my mother has celiac disease and she thinks that her, her physician told her that it might be from her thyroid because she mm. has a problem with her thyroid. Mm, I, I don't think that the necessarily related to the thyroid, but I think people can sometimes have problems with both. Um, Victoria, did you have a question? I do. Um, when I was 40 years old, my uh, doctor noticed um, an irregularity in my heartbeat and I felt fluttering. So I wore a halter monitor, mm -hmm. but nothing came of it. Um, you know, all the results were negative. And then lucky for me, I never picked up my children from school because I was a working mom, but I did one day. And another mom who was also 40 years old said that she was wearing a halter monitor for this increased um, heart rate. And so what I learned later on was that it was a perimenopausal symptom. It's a change in hormones that can bring this on. So is this something you've encountered where women that are perimenopausal, not even menopausal, have these uh, irregular heartbeats or these palpitations, these flutterings? Of course, they need testing, but what, what has been um, your, your take on this? How many women have you seen? Um, is, it, is it prevalent and is it misdiagnosed? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, it's definitely uh, commonly seen that uh, people can have palpitations and um, the exact testing, like you're saying, is the halter monitor where you wear a monitor so that we can determine if it is actually something dangerous that needs treatment or if it's just kind of extra heartbeats that don't cause any kind of problem. Um, and this is something that can definitely be related to uh, perimenopause and menopause because the change in hormones can definitely have effects on the vascular system. And that's part of the reason why you have heart flashes, heart flashes with menopause is because of, uh, you know, it's called a vasomotor problem where the blood vessels, you know, dilate or constrict at different points in time. Um, so it can definitely be related to that. And that's probably like a perfect example of something that would have a lot of bias around it because definitely something like palpitations, it could be that when you actually get to the doctor, you know, and they do the tests, you don't see anything because perhaps you didn't have the palpitation when you're in the office. Um, and so then when women kind of get this label of just mm -hmm. like, you know, making things up or exaggerating things, um, but it, these are real symptoms and it definitely does occur. Uh, so that's definitely something to, um, that I could see that would be somewhere where a disparity could come up and women might not be taken seriously. So that would definitely be something where if you feel like you haven't been adequately listened to by your doctor for that situation, that you should maybe try to see somebody else and make sure that they're actually, you know, listening to you and taking your concerns seriously. Well, my disappointment was, was not that the doctor didn't take action. He had me wear the halter monitor. What I was disappointed in uh, that he did not know that this could be perimenopausal. I had to find this out from another mom. Mm -hmm. That's my disappointment and, and the disparity in, in the education or maybe in the studies, in the research, in the literature. Mm -hmm. I don't know where the disparity comes from, but uh, I, I think there needs to be education on perimenopausal and menopausal symptoms. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if, if, if yes, you feel I definitely that way as, a, as another woman. 
Yes, I think it's something that um, is not a huge focus of, you know, medical education, let's say that. Um, and this is kind of some, as kind of like what I said in the presentation, like even, you know, my residents that I asked today, were not aware that, um, certain things are, you know, like having early menopause or having preeclampsia can put women at higher risk of cardiac disease. This is definitely a place where, uh, we really need to work on improving the medical education for doctors. And what you mentioned about, um, hope, uh, I'm very happy and encouraged that, uh, so there's hope and, and new residents are coming and getting it right more than in the past. Are you aware about uh, anything, like you mentioned representation several times mm -hmm. and there's definitely a movement about representation and uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Do you know if that is also a big push in medicine in the schools? Yes, I do believe that, that most medical schools have incorporated that into the curriculum now that for sure that is definitely much more of a focus than it was in years past. Thank you. Um, I used to work as a medical interpreter in, in Boston, and I, I also feel that um, I feel like what I what we used to see is a lot of women, um, well, like I interpreted obviously for immigrant uh, patients in general from, from Latin America. And the, the way that women see doctors and especially male doctors, it's, it's, it's in a way of like, it's an authority and I'm not going to question. And I'm that uh, there's no advocacy for your own health. Uh, so I would love to see, yeah, like more like awareness uh, of like mm -hmm. why, like culturally also. Uh, women from Latin America will never um, like say like, no, that's not what's happening or like you're missing this. This is my symptom. Um, so I'm, I'm very happy to hear that there's open your new uh, conversations in, in medical school. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. That's one of uh, the, I think, important things about both like awareness for the, um, you know, the healthcare professionals to be aware that they have these biases, even if they're unconscious. And also for patients to be aware of things that they can advocate for, for themselves, that it's their health that, you know, so they should be, uh, they shouldn't be afraid to ask questions or, you know, uh, make sure that their uh, questions are answered. Thank you. Thank you. And, um, Anyone who has questions, please feel free. Um, uh, in the meantime, like you think about your questions, I, I would like to ask you, as an organization and the Center for the Women of New York, uh, is there something that comes to your mind in terms of like, what can we do to help these inequities? I mean, that's a big question, but <laughs> certainly oh, I think awareness is important so that, that people, you know, if they don't even know about what, um, you know, what are risk factors or how, you know, uh, heart attacks or strokes can present differently with women, then um, they won't even make it to the next step of, of getting treatment. Thank you. So this is a good first step. Uh, what is the go red? Uh, sorry, oh yeah, so that's a campaign um, from the American Heart Association that's been for a while. So there's like, a, it's in February and there's like a Go Red for Women Day where you're supposed to wear red to raise awareness uh, for women's uh, heart issues. And um, sometimes they have like uh, luncheons and other kind of events to, to raise awareness. Maybe we should do a luncheon. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe we should All do right. something with them. Mm -hmm. Uh, awesome. Before before we answer Amela's next question, I want to make a comment on the the need for Go Red every February because women in that sandwich generation they're still caring for their children, they're caring for their a, um, ailing parents, and they're not caring for themselves. Mm -hmm. So I think part of the Go Red campaign is also to make sure women get checkups. They, they're bringing everybody else to regular checkups, but not themselves. Mm -hmm. And and the stress that they're under, juggling those, those other generations and not caring for themselves leads to, I believe, more heart ailments, the, the physical I, and emotional stress. You mentioned that, Victoria, reminded me of a friend who just told me, 
um, like my husband's really like upset. He needs to go to the doctor because of pelvic floor issues, uh, some like incontinence, and it's only his fifties. And and I don't like, but you have that too, right? And it's like, yeah, like I've never mentioned to to anyone, not even to her husband. <laughs> And and the husband here he is like extremely concerned and wants to make an appointment ASAP. And <laughs> and the woman who has had uh like incontinence, like sneezing and like um when sneezing and has never mentioned it, not even to her husband. Um, so it's definitely an issue. Uh women do not raise their, you know, what's going on with them because we're busy taking care of others, or it's just like I'm not going to bother right now with. Uh, with this small issue, with this small symptom, uh, but it is important to bring it up. Um, and I'm saying this as I'm thinking of all the issues that I maybe should have checked up. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so Amela okay. is mentioning, um, she wonders if maybe the endocrine system has any involvement in uh, celiac and thyroid disorder. It hurts to see her mother suffer with thyroid disorder. Oh, I'm sorry about that for your mom. Um, yes, I mean the thyroid is part of the endocrine system, so definitely all of these things are related. And in general, in the body, like anytime one system is off, there is always kind of like a cascade of things that happens elsewhere. Like we, you know, everything is supposed to work together. All of the systems are supposed to work together, so you really don't have like you know, it, you can have problems with multiple areas, you know, even when it's just primary one thing that's going wrong. Um, but hopefully, I mean, it, the thyroid things do tend to be things that can be treated very well though. So hopefully your mom can get the, the right care and treatment for what she needs. Thank you for your questions, Samela. Again, this is- thank, uh... thank you, Lara. She also has very bad anxiety as well. And I wonder if maybe all of that is connected, but from this information that you just given, I think that definitely it is a cascade and it just uh, shows how much, how much of a strong woman she is to, you know, to manage all of those feelings and everything that, you know, she can't necessarily control. But I, I remember like her going through so many different medications and, uh, you know, I, I hope that, that, you know, there's a lot of research to help with these issues because as a woman in my thirties, early thirties, I know that one day I'm going to go through menopause as well. <laughs> and I hope that by that time, we're going to have better resources and more access to, to helpful resources for our well-being. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I hope so too, because <laughs> I am also approaching that age. <laughs> <laughs> that is not my department, but I heard that there is a new medication that came out recently for uh, for menopause. But I can't I can't speak to that since I am not uh, OBGYN. Uh, but I, I thought that it was important that what um what Mala Sandra mentioned about anxiety mm -hmm. and how and we haven't mentioned that in like today, but it, that comes up a lot in all our workshops. Uh, either like financial literacy, career skills. And I, I just don't want to um, forget mentioning that, like mental health, depression, anxiety, and how that affects uh, our physical health. And I am not in front of statistics and I wish I, I, I had that information, but I have a feeling that, that, you know, there are factors that affect women likely more than, than men. Um, uh, definitely mental health can affect your physical health. And I mean, they're really not separate things. I mean, a, often mental health is a, a physical, you know, disruption of the things, the neurotransmitters in the brain. Um, and it, be, you know, getting treatment for, you know, anxiety and things can only help any other medical problems because if someone is having anxiety and depression, they're less likely to take care of all of their other issues. Um, so certainly it's much more likely that the other issues will get worse. Well, um, I'd like to say that like it, it was inspiring, like hearing you say and hearing you talk about um, these inequities, it, it does push me at least like to make appointments. <laughs> and after, <laughs> and oh, wait, after I think there's another question in the chat. Yes. Uh, 
you this is from uh, Patricia Latona from Zanta Club of New York. You mentioned lifestyle is a major risk factor. Can you expand on that? And what can women do to reduce these risks? Sure. Um, so the number one thing that women can do is to stop smoking if you smoke. Uh, that's definitely like the fastest way to improve your, uh, your outcomes. And I would say, even if, um, say you live with a smoker to try to avoid that, have the person not smoke near you or try to get them to quit as well would also be better because even just exposure to smoke, um, increases your risk, even if you're not doing it yourself. Um, and then there are things like you're having, managing your blood pressure and diabetes, which, so someone would have to go to a checkup, Cecilia, in order to know if they had high blood pressure or uh, high sugar. Uh, so definitely, definitely managing those things is important. Um, and it does require getting checked out because a lot of times people don't know that they have high blood pressure because you may not feel any symptoms from that, uh, for a very long time. Um, so it's often called the silent killer. And so you don't want to wait until like some sort of damage has been done, uh, to address that. And we have a lot of treatments that, uh, have very little side effects that we can do for, for high blood pressure and, and diabetes. Um, so other issues are, um, and high cholesterol, I put that in there with that same thing. And, uh, so weight, I mean, weight is a huge issue in general. I mean, I, I'm not going to go say like, oh, you should just go out and lose 20 pounds. No problem. It's easy. Um, I know that it's not easy to lose weight. Um, and so I don't like to, you know, blame people or, you know, kind of say things like that. Um, that's a very complicated process in the body. Once someone, um, has overweight or has obesity. And, uh, I, what I would like to say is that sometimes just small changes can make big improvements in things like high blood pressure and diabetes. So if someone is overweight, they don't have to go and lose like, you know, 50 pounds or 75 pounds to improve their, uh, heart, uh, risk, even just losing something like 10 pounds can improve the blood pressure and sugars. Uh, so that's number one is that it doesn't have to be this, like such a huge insurmountable goal. Um, and the other thing I would say about weight loss is that there are some newer medications that, um, are being used for weight loss that are very, very effective. Uh, so certainly somebody who, if they've, they've had obesity for a long time, um, definitely talking to their doctor about one of those medications would be, uh, a very important thing to do. Um, and then the last one would be physical activity. Um, cause as I mentioned before, just in general, the way our lifestyle is now is just so sedentary, um, that just sitting in a computer all day is just not good for our bodies and for the heart and really anything else in your body, as far as like your joints and back pain and all sorts of things like that. Um, so, you know, in general, trying to like, just walk around a bit more during the day. Um, and I think the recommendations are something like 150 minutes, uh, per week of like either like kind of brisk walking, I guess. Um, and that can be, you know, any time over the week. Um, and in addition, uh, weight or resistance training is also important for maintaining muscle mass and, um, and bone mass and, uh, preventing osteoporosis. So also that doesn't have to be some like crazy lifting thing either, <laughs> even just using your own body weight for things, um, you know, doing things like squats and things like that can be helpful. And that can be done with no equipment and not having to join a gym or anything. Lara, I'm so glad you mentioned uh, secondhand smoke. When I was carpooling my children to school with another classmate, she would come into the car smelling of smoke. Mm -hmm. And my daughter forbid me to speak to her mother about the risks of secondhand smoke. So I still feel guilty to this day. Is that child more likely as an adult now to have um, heart risk factors? Hi. Yes. I don't know the exact numbers on it, but yes, I would think that the, uh, the secondhand smoke exposure, it also depends on the amount. Um, so that also is kind of like how much were they exposed to and at what age also, cause kids are going to be more susceptible because they're, you know, their bodies are smaller and their lungs are smaller. But people used to do a lot of things before that they, we now realize are not optimal. <laughs> Yeah, lucky for that, we know more about secondhand smoke, mm -hmm. but I think we need to create awareness about that for those who don't know. Thank you so much. Um, I, I, what I was saying before, as an individual, I feel inspired to go to the doctor. I, I always try to lead by example, and I will, I'm realizing that I'm not a great example <laughs> after listening to you. 
Um, but also as an organization, I think it is important that we do more about this issue. Um, in a way, we do have a board member who um, is spearheading um, a health fair. So stay tuned, everyone. Uh, we'll try to have our, our health fair, uh, health fair um, before the end of the year and we'll corner uh, with the hospital. So, um, and, and the red, uh, go red day, definitely. We'll, we'll have a lunch or something um, in February. And I'm just saying it out loud. It is being recorded so uh, we can keep <laughs> ourselves uh, yeah, accountable. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I know like it's, we're all so busy, but this is a very important issue and I would like to, um, uh, to commit to it. So thank you, Lara, for, for all the information uh, for presenting today. I know, Victoria, you have some slides to share, right? Yes. Um, and I just want to shout out to Mickey Belosi, who is president of uh, New York Central Now. Thank you for joining us and for all the women here and, and gentlemen. So if you visit our website, we have curated uh, resources for women. Whoops, wrong. Sorry. Uh, and so these are some of the topics that we want to bridge the gap to these inequities by creating awareness. We have resources on heart health, stroke and women, uh, beyond uh, what our illustrious presenter has presented today, uh, cancers in women, headaches and migraines depression in women, autoimmune diseases. And we also have resources on reproductive health and hoping to bridge the gap with those inequities. Uh, early pregnancy loss, miscarriage, stillbirths. Women are stigmatized not to talk about it. And those who know about it don't know what to say to these women. There is a lot of uh, mental health and uh, anxiety over those episodes. So we at the center have these resources curated so that we can create awareness. Thank you so much, Victoria. Um, I don't know if you have um, more. Do you have the slides uh, with the contact information? And yes, all that, that would that? be next. So since you're sharing uh, already, I want you to share them. So. Uh, our wonderful president has urged us to take action by creating awareness for ourselves on these cardiac inequities with women and on all the other issues. And she's going to take the lead and take care of herself very soon. And I'll remind <laughs> you, Cecilia. Thank you. So Thank do you. spread the word about those differences on how women present differently from men and the biases in the medical profession. So Cecilia, these are the upcoming events, as you mentioned earlier. Yes, uh, I think I yeah, already mentioned them, so I won't bore you with that. Uh, but um, lastly, we want to invite you to become a member of the center. Um, it's like a $25 membership uh, for the year, and it helps support our programs. Uh, you can become a member on our website. You can just simply go to cwny.org and you'll find uh, the links to membership and donations there as well. Yeah, you can also follow us on, on social media. I think that's it. Oh, like, here's our other two locations, but you can go to the next one. I think I mentioned the locations before. And uh, you can uh, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. And we have a podcast that we're trying to revamp So, Thank you everyone so much for joining us today. Um, Lara, it's hard for me to say uh, Dr. Colora because <laughs> our neighbors work together in many different capacities. Uh, Miki, thank you so much for coming. And uh, thank you, Victoria, for putting it together. Lana, for sharing uh, in the chat. And everyone for participating. Have a wonderful afternoon, everyone. And thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Um, hopefully see you uh, at the next think tank, next one. Take care, Bye. everyone. Bye.